What I wrote the book about, and I hope you all in, enjoy the book, it was my attempt to capture uh, 30 years of both practice, uh, research, and lessons learned from my patients about how healing actually works. I was in the fortunate position of being able to not only uh, see it firsthand as a child what different kinds of cultural healing practices were like, having been raised in the military and lived literally all over the world, from Asia to Europe and every place in between, uh, but also then as a physician to see that in my own practice uh, and in the practices of others uh, stationed in Germany, for example, as a, as a physician, to see that they did things a little bit differently than I did and a little bit similar, and then had the fortunate opportunity of recycling all that through a research lens as a director of a WHO Center for Integrative Healing, looking at traditional medical practices, uh, which is about 80% of what the world does in healthcare, by the way, uh, and then uh, beginning to look at that through uh, the lens of modern science to try to understand what's going on here. Uh, how can such a diverse group of healing philosophies, traditions, thinking, concepts, about the way the world is uh, actually converge on uh, improvement in people's health and well-being uh, when they're so different. Uh, when I was in medical school, I thought that science was the only lens, and I still am a scientist and believe scientist is probably the most powerful lens that we have to understand uh, how healing works, and I explain that in my book. But we need to rethink science, too, because science itself is extremely useful for gaining knowledge. But when it comes to applying that knowledge back into the messy world, ecological world of complex human beings, um, then it has limitations. And we are bumping up against those limitations big time now. Uh, and unless we rethink uh, how we go about healing, we're going to continue to bankrupt this country with the health care system, and our health care outcomes are going to continue to decline, and they are. So we need to begin to ask a different question in health care reform. Health care reform in this town is, uh, you know, probably every week you hear something about changes in health care and health care reform, and usually it's about who's paying and what are they going to pay for? And who covers it? Is it going to be you, your employer, the government, the private sector? And I submit to you that this is the wrong question. That it doesn't really matter who pays if what we're doing is actually not producing health and well-being. The fundamental question needs to be how does health care and how can health care actually get us to health and well-being? That should be the fundamental question then we can figure out how, how to pay for that. Because if, we can't, if we're not paying for that, then we're not going to get to a place where costs are going to go down and health is improved, no matter what happens. And I'll, I'll illustrate this with a couple of cases. So these are two patients that, um, that I had. This is not their real names, Joe and Sally, but let me introduce them to you. Uh, Joe was a typical person with uh, multiple chronic illnesses, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and heart disease. He also was overweight. Um, Sally was an individual with chronic pain and on and off opioids. She also had depression. Both of these individuals were in a healthcare system, a military healthcare system, that has platinum level healthcare, the best of the best access to full medications, access to uh, uh, specialists, pills and procedures, et cetera. And so they had full health care. Sally was a senior executive, a civilian, SES, worked for the, for the Pentagon, ran a multi-million dollar program for the Pentagon, and very busy, as you can imagine. Uh, she was on her way to the Pentagon to a meeting uh, on five hours of sleep, and she had a car accident. Uh, she rear-ended somebody. Uh, that tells you a little bit about how well she was functioning, right? The car wouldn't start. They called an ambulance. They took her to the emergency room. She had some back pain. 
they did some x-rays, examined her, and they didn't see anything broken. And so they put her on what are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and referred her to physical therapy. She went physical therapy uh, once, started to feel a little bit better, and then got back into her job. About three months later, again, on about five hours of sleep, she was reaching over to pick up her suitcase, and she heard a pop and had excruciating pain going down her leg. She thought, oh, I've done it now. Something bad has happened. She called 911. They took her back to the emergency room. But because she'd been on non-steroidal medications and physical therapy, they now put her on opioids. Exactly. Man, she loved that. It was great. Opioids work for acute pain. She felt so much better that she kept taking them. And she kept trying to continue to work. And she kept getting more. And she kept taking them and she kept trying to get to work without fundamentally changing the underlying physiology and psychology in her own body to help her stay well. And she developed something very, very typical of people with chronic pain who are put on opioids called opioid tolerance. And what it means is that the more you take, the less it works and the more you need. And so she continued to then up the dose. And then she began to get what platinum level health care gets you. She started to go and get injections in the sports medicine clinic. She got a TENS unit to treat this. She went and got acupuncture, actually, which we provide, and manipulation. Injections and steroids, uh, and, uh, and then was told to get off the opioids, but she didn't want to do it. She says, I'm not addicted. I have back pain, and I need it. Eventually, she had to stop working because she couldn't function both with the pain and the medications that she was on, and so she had to go on disability. Then she sent over to behavioral medicine. She should have been sent earlier. Um, behavioral medicine says, you know, we should do some counseling, Psycho psychotherapy. She said, I'm not crazy. I have back pain. However, she got another diagnosis, depression, and she was put on another medication to treat her depression. So now she has 10 years of chronic back pain, multiple treatments of all kinds, and uh, she's intermittently taking medications. She was sent over to the surgeon. Uh, the surgeon looked at her, and fortunately, the surgeon was a military surgeon, doesn't make any money off of doing surgery, uh, looked at her and said, as 85% of people with chronic back pain have, you have a non-surgical problem, you have a musculoskeletal problem, Surgery is not indicated, so she ended up not getting surgery. Had she been on the outside in the civilian sector where they do make money for that, she probably would have gotten surgery. And I have many patients like that who have gotten surgery. So opio, uh, Sally is not alone. There are many people like Sally. In fact, there's been two presidential commissions that have said we have a problem with the way we treat chronic pain. But instead of trying to fix the chronic pain management problem, uh, they have started to restrict one section of that, which is the opioid problem, which is a problem, by the way. But it's actually a symptom of the problem and not the problem itself. The problem is how we manage a chronic disease called chronic pain. And we're trying to fix it by restricting the lens of opioids and making them non-available and controlling and this actually is uh, leading to now a backlash around the opioid restriction because people who need them are not actually getting them. Now, there are shortages, for example, of opioid in hospitals, people in palliative care who need uh, opioids for pain at the end of life are now saying, gee, I shouldn't take them because I might get addicted and we're not supposed to be taking them. And so we're trying to fix a problem through a lens uh, that is not addressing the underlying cause. Fortunately, a number of groups have said that we got to get at the underlying cause, which is better management of non using non-drug approaches to chronic pain. The American College of Physicians, the primary internal medicine group in the country, has said use non-pharmacological approaches. The CDC, the FDA, the Joint Commission, which is the commission that inspects the hospitals and approves that, have all said, use non-pharmacological approaches to pain. The Defense Department and the VA are using non-pharmacological approaches to pain. They're already implementing those and training individuals in doing those. 
Uh, had we listened to our patients for the last 20 years, we would know that if they have pain, they're already using these things. They were just called complementary and alternative medicine. In fact, if uh, you look at the top three reasons why people use therapeutic massage, yoga, acupuncture, manipulation, mind-body practices, the first two reasons are pain, the third reason is pain. <laughs> the fourth reason is pain. The fifth reason is stress and anxiety, especially if it's accompanied by pain. Patients are already using these things. 60 to 70% of patients with chronic pain regularly use some kind of non-conventional approach. And now the uh, guidelines are saying use these approach, approaches. Uh, but the problem is the healthcare system is caught in between. Because I was not taught how to use those approaches in medical school. I do not know how to get reimbursed for using those approaches in medical school. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know actually how to set up a team to make sure those approaches actually get implemented. But probably the most important thing is that my patients don't know how to ask me for these things. When they come into my office, the Sallies of the world came in to see me, and I ask her, well, what do you do for your pain? The first thing they do is start describing the medications that they're juggling around. They're not even sure actually how to ask the question about the underlying determinants because we have a culture that has constructed a pills and procedure approach for most chronic diseases, including chronic pain. And the dialogue in the culture does not even begin, get, begin to get at the underlying factors of healing. So how do you change a culture like that when all facets are driving you one direction <laughs> and you know this, that you have to go the other direction because the science tells you you have to go the other direction? How do you change that culture? The first thing you do is stop narrowing the lens and, beginning to, and begin to open up the lens to begin to ask the questions about the underlying determinants of health and chronic illness. And you do that by asking questions about the whole person. What is the whole person and what are those questions? Well, here's a model that I use in my book to describe the whole person. It consists of the body, we know, and the physical external environment. But a person also consists of their own behavior and lifestyle components and the social and emotional aspects of their life that are so valuable to them with their family and their social relationships and the spiritual and the mental components of those. What's meaningful for them? Why do they get up in the morning? Why do they do what they do? These are, the, at the minimum, four layers of what make up a human being. And so if we want to take care of the whole person and help them heal as a whole, we need, we need to ask questions about all of these layers. And I do this through something called a hope note. Now, how many of you are familiar with something called the soap note? Okay, probably about half of you. So people don't know what a soap note is? No. Okay. You need to know what a soap note is because your doctor knows and your electronic medical record knows. It's actually structured that. SOAP stands for subjective, that's what you tell, objective, what the doctor, the healthcare provider sees in the tests, okay? Assessment, that's the A part of the SOAP, that's your diagnosis, okay? That's, uh, if you wanna get paid, you gotta make sure the A has a CPT code attached to it. <laughs> And then the plan, which is the evidence-based treatment for the assessment. That's the people. Okay, SOAP. Uh, little do patients know, although the entire healthcare system knows, that as soon as the patient walks into the office, they are in the SOAP box. Okay? Because your doctor actually has to construct whatever you tell them and put it into a SOAP note. Your electronic medical record actually records it in the structure of a soap note, okay? The soap note, for the most part now, deals with this outside layer of the human being. Very rarely does it get into these inner layers of the lifestyle, of the social, emotional, and the spiritual, and the mental. In fact, uh, the questions are sometimes, if you do ask some of those questions, they're sort of put off to the side in the social history, right? Which is rarely actually addressed much when you're treating somebody. 
And so if we want to actually address the underlying determinants and provide whole person care, do something I call integrated health, we need to ask these other questions. Instead of simply asking, what's the matter with you, which is what Sally had for 10 years, which led her to all those treatments, we need to ask what matters to you. We need to have a dialogue within the encounter that is about meaning and purpose and try to identify that. And that's called the HOPE Note. That stands for Healing Oriented Practices and Environments Note. And so what I teach in medical school and what I teach my residents and what I practice in, in my own practice, which is a military hospital, platinum level, is to try to teach people to do after the HOPE soap Note, do the HOPE Note. And I have a whole structure on how to do that. So I did that for Sally. So Sally came in to see me because she'd seen everybody else and they said, oh, we now have an integrative chronic pain clinic like you have integrative center here that provides things. Uh, and she came in and she was sitting there like that. And the first thing she told me was things she told everybody else. I'm not crazy. I'm not addicted. I got pain. Okay. I had to begin to open up and ask other questions. I need to had to find out what mattered to Sally in her life and then be able to connect that to evidence-based therapeutic approaches. So here's what emerged out of that visit. Uh, when I asked Sally what mattered, the first thing she started describing me is, how do I juggle all these medications? Okay, got it. Fortunately, we have a pharmacologist on our team that can help do that, all right? So I set up an appointment actually within the same visit to meet with a pharmacologist. But I said, Sally, I need to know about other things. What do you do to manage your own pain? She said, well, over the years I've discovered only one thing that will really get me through the day, and that's heat and stretching. And so I get up in the, I bought a hot tub, I get up in the morning, I get in the hot tub and I stretch for an hour. And if I do that, I can get through noon before I have to start popping the pills. Okay? What does that sound like to you? Does that sound like a therapeutic modality that might be offered over in the, uh, in the integrative health clinic here at GW? Maybe, I don't know. Anybody? It is, okay, so somebody just said it, yoga, right? So I immediately said, Sally, have you tried yoga? Oh, yeah. I went to one of those classes, and the lady was, you know, tied up in a pretzel in the front. I tried to do that, and I got hurt. doesn't work for me. But she was trying to actually mimic yoga, right? But she actually hadn't gotten therapeutic yoga. Sally, how's your sleep? Oh, it's fine. How much do you get? Four to five hours. Is it rested? No. She, that's just everything she'd experienced. That's how she'd been functioning. She didn't realize that lack of sleep increases inflammatory factors in your body. It impairs your immune system, and it helps maintain chronic pain. How's your stress level, Sally? I don't have any stress. <laughs> I used to, when I was running the big Pentagon office, I was, you know, running around and Appointments here, appointments there, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of responsibility. That was stress, okay, in her mind. But now I just sit at home and try to take care of myself and wait till the kids come home. Sally was totally unaware how chronic pain induces stress in your body. It puts you in a chronic state of stress. It bumps up cortisol. It increases inflammation in your body. It increases muscle spasm. It perpetuates the cycle of chronic pain. Pain, but she didn't see that she was in any kind of stress. But it was actually one of the underlying causes. I said, Sally, do you have a place to heal? I mean, if we were to set up a way for this for you to get better, where would you do it in your house? She thought for a little bit, and she couldn't actually think of a place. I said, what about your bedroom? No, can't do that. There's clutter all over the place, and there's a leak over there, and there's, you know, I've got to get the wall fixed, and... People are running in and out, interrupting me all the time. It's just not. Uh, it's, she had no place that she could actually go to take care of herself to heal. A physical place we could do that. What's the biggest problem, Sally, that um, this pain has produced? If you didn't have it, what would you do? She said, that's easy. She said, I knew I was doomed when my uh, husband and my children started calling me Sally. I said, what do you mean? Isn't that your name? Oh, yeah, but they used to call me Salary because I brought home the bacon, and that I really love doing. I love my job, but I couldn't do that anymore, and I lost the reason I'm here.
and she was angry at her body for doing that. Yes. So now this looks a little hopeless, right? I mean, it sounds like a sort of a hopeless case, but we now know exactly how to set up her healing team. Because now we know what matters to Sally and what needs to be addressed in those areas. And so here's what her team looked like. It had a physician, that was me, but I didn't do anything. I was just sort of coordinating the team. I was setting up the joint goals and expectations. We had a pharmacologist because she had drugs she had to manage properly. And she couldn't just be running over here and getting recommendations to all kinds of people. That had to be integrated. We had a behaviorist, but she already didn't want to go get counseling. So the behaviorist had to begin to act differently and had to approach her in a different way. And the behaviorist had to be there to be more like a health coach than a counselor, someone that was going to facilitate her ability to engage in behaviors in her regular life. We needed a yoga therapist, but we, didn't need, we needed somebody who actually knew how to deal with people in chronic pain, somebody who was a specialist in chronic pain, who is certified in yoga therapy in those areas and could work on our team. We had the physician pharmacologist behaviors are all part of the team that I, that I sit on, okay? So we had those available internally. They're covered. Yoga therapy wasn't. Yoga therapist she had to pay for. We needed her family on board because if she was going to embed this in her daily life, they were going to need to support her in that process, allowing her to set up a place to do this, not interrupting her while she was doing that, allowing her to take care of herself as part of that. And we needed her body on board, which really means we needed her mind on board about her body. <laughs> we needed her to think differently to get the anger out that she had about her body and learn that her body actually could be a friend and not the enemy. So this is what the healthcare team looked like, a merger of conventional medicine, evidence-based complementary medicine, and self-care. This is called integrative healthcare. Uh, it looked in many ways very similar to what you get when you walk into many places, but in many ways it was profoundly different because it's coordinating a team that's focusing on the underlying health healing determinants, not just the pills and procedures to treat the soap note. So once we got all that set up and everybody was aligned, including her own attitude, okay, we sent her to the yoga therapist. She called me up the evening after her first visit and said, my pain is 2 over 10. It hasn't been 2 in 5 years. Okay? Was she healed? No. Was she cured? No, she wasn't. But she had launched a healing journey using an integrative model. And now, over the next peri period of about uh, 3 to 6 months, her pain was consistently, as she began to embed this in her own life, her pain was consistently down to 2 after 3 months, and within about five to six months, she actually talked about going back to work, gaining her purpose again. She was on her healing journey. This is how healing happens. Okay? Now, all of this happens within the context of healthcare, the cultural context and the social determinants. And those social determinants can either enhance or the ability to make this integrative approach merged where all these things actually it's easy to do or can make it difficult. And for those that don't have access to all of the aspects, they're not going to actually be able to get integrative care. So the social determinants are one of the major inhibitors or enhancers of the ability to deliver integrative health. Our attitudes is one of the major deliverers for integrative health. So we need the context to be able to allow that little overlap that I show you in the middle there, integrative health, to become the entire way healthcare is delivered for chronic illnesses. Now, if we don't do this, and right now we're doing it pretty slowly, if we don't do this, if we stick up into where we're comfortable as a mainstream healthcare group, that's in that top circle there, that orange circle, if we just sit in that circle and say, that's enough, this is where the science has been. This is what we need to do. We're going to have, continue to have major challenges. Because guess what? We already have those challenges here because we're not doing this. And here's some examples. We are first in spending in health care of any other country. We are 37th, according to the WHO, by health metrics, by aggregate health metrics compared to other countries. 
right now at the current inflation rate, if we just keep paying for what we're doing in that top circle, we're going to be spending 25% of our GNP just on medical care. And if that keeps going, we'll have the luxury or <laughs> of, sp of spending half by uh, 2080. We cannot afford that. It's not possible. Because of the growth and the cost of medical care, disparities are widening. There's a bigger and bigger gap over the last 20 years between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, you can have full access, but the access that you're going to have is actually not going to produce health. The data is in. This is an Institute of Medicine National Academy report. There's multiple others that have shown this. And what this report did is it traced the top rich countries, the OCED countries in the world. We happen to be one of those rich countries. Uh, with For 30 years, looking at the healthcare costs and the outcomes, the primary outcomes of chronic illnesses across all of those countries. The United States was getting worse in nine of the 12 over that period of time. And here's a list of some of the ones. In fact, we're getting worse in everything except two areas, primarily. If you live to be 65, you're going to live longer. And if you have cancer, you're going to live longer. We're really good at keeping you alive. Now, people want to be kept alive, right? OK, we don't want to be dive. Not that we want to abandon this. But that is primarily what we're good at. When it comes to chronic disease management, acute care disease, we're masters of. Everybody that doesn't have that wants it, right? Um, but in chronic disease, we're not work it's not working anymore. Here's, here's a graph that I think illustrates our losing value in healthcare better than any. This is mapping healthcare cost per capita on the bottom with life expectancy. And let's see if I can get the, here's the US. <laughs> Here's the other countries, okay? And these are, the, these are the considered the rich countries in the world, okay? And here we are. We spend double any other country, and our life expectancy is around the Czech Republic, somewhere between Czech Republic and Portugal. Portugal beats us in those areas. So even keeping us alive is not working very well anymore. And in the last two years, because of the overuse of opioids primarily, our life expectancy in this country has started to decline for the first time in 100 years. We're losing value. Well, if the value is no longer coming from medical treatment as we currently do it, where is it? Where is the value? Where does health come from? If suddenly everybody in the country had platinum level health care like Sally did, how much health would that actually produce? How much would our population's health improve? Any guesses? Go ahead. Be bold. Wouldn't change at all. So zero improvement in health with universal access. So why are we fighting for it then? So here's real, I mean, we've got two real pessimistic moods here. One's going to be zero, or one is going to be negative, actually, because <laughs> they're going to overuse, but, but what the overuse is not actually going to improve health is what you're going to suggest, right? Uh, you know, we're going to spend more money, but it isn't going to get better. Any optimists in the group here? I mean, can we have a positive number to this, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, race and income have a huge factor, right? Make a huge factor in here. Well, here's where the value is, and you're absolutely right, okay? If everybody right now just had universal access to platinum-level health care like Sally, it would improve the health of the nation by about 15 to 20 percent. They've actually documented this, okay? In randomized controlled trials and experiments. Uh, that's because most of health doesn't come from what we do in medicine. It comes from these two other big areas, okay, three areas actually, behavior and lifestyle, behavior, uh, and the social and the economic impacts, which are that context, that blue circle that I showed you, <laughs> that either allows this to happen or allows it not to happen. Uh, if you're going to eat healthily and you live a in a place where you can't actually get food, then how are you going to eat in a healthy fashion? 
okay? So if healthcare wants to get on board with producing health, we need to get out of our little black box up there and begin to address these underlying determinants of illness. And that's what integrative medicine is about. It's about opening the lens to the underlying determinants, both of behavior and lifestyle, as well as the social impact. Let me show you another example. This is uh, Joe. Uh, I mentioned to you that he had multiple chronic illnesses. He did. He was 69, and I saw him after he had a heart attack. He was sent to me for his cardiac rehab and follow-up visits. Uh, here's his history. His father had a heart attack at 65 and died at 75. That's when he stopped smoking. He was 35 at the time. He developed hypertension uh, at 42. He gained weight after he left the Navy. He developed di type 2 diabetes, uh, from, mostly from the weight gain, probably, at 55. He had good medical care, like many of our veterans do. He had full benefits. Joe was the food man. He'd spent 30 years in the Navy doing food, from peeling potatoes on the PT boat, 12 men, uh, all the way up then to aircraft carriers, 6,000 people. He had responsible for the food then for entire bases, families, et cetera, and then he became an advisor to the entire Navy on food over that 30 years. He was a food guy. He knew food. And he had watched food go from preparing it at scratch, which he did on the PT boats when he, boats when he started his uh, career, all the way to what he called industrialized food. This was packaged and canned stuff that was brought in, shipped in cheaper, high salt, high fat, high sugar, uh, that is now delivered and heated up in the mess halls. Uh, that was the primary staple. Now, during the time he watched this happen inside the Navy, it was also happening outside the Navy. What do we call it? We call it fast food, right, exactly. And so the young uh, service members, men and women now, that were coming into the Navy, they wanted this kind of food. They were conditioned now to eating this way so that in the latter part of his career when they said, hey, you got to go back to peeling potatoes, go back to scratch, bring in more fruits and vegetables, et cetera, uh, he couldn't do it because if you put that into the mess hall, they would just go down the street and eat at the local Burger King. And then he would lose money because they weren't eating in the mess hall and they'd cut his budget the next year. So he actually couldn't do it. He said, Doc, you know, I now realize that this is what I did too. I ate this way. And all my buddies eat this way. So he came in and we did a integrative health visit for Joe. Uh, and here's the list of all the soaps that he'd had over his career. Uh, he had hypertension. He was on uh, two drugs for that. Um, Elevated cholesterol, a statin, diabetes, metformin. Uh, when he was diagnosed with obesity, they sent him to the dietitian. He went to one visit and he said, I know more about food than she does. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> now he's post MI and they put him in, they told him to go to cardiac rehab, which is primarily supervised exercise, right? He hated exercise. That's why he stopped after he left the Navy. He didn't like exercise. Uh, and so he wanted to know what to do. Now he's He's had a stent, and the stent probably saved his life, by the way. So it was good he got the stent, okay? And he's now on a beta blocker also to keep his blood pressure down and to prevent heart attacks. Um, his post-MI is cardiac rehab. So we sit down and we ask Joe what matters to you. He said, well, I got all these drugs. I got to figure out what to do with them. Okay, we know how to do that. Um, I don't want to die like my dad. I'm almost 70. He died at 75. Can you do something to reduce the chances that I'm going to die? He did. Okay. He wants to prevent further disease. Um, you know, I, need, I, I know I have to do something with fitness and food and that kind of stuff. I don't smoke anymore. Um, but I don't like that fitness stuff. Is there something else you can do? I need to begin to interact with my family and my friends differently because every afternoon he'd head over to the club and he and his friends would have a burger and some fries and several drinks and enjoy talking with each other, right? So his friends were supporting the same kind. Of, most of what they talked about was their visits to the doctors and the medications. <laughs> <laughs> but the most important problem that he had was that ever since he retired, he wasn't sure what he was about anymore. He'd spent 30 years in service to the country. He'd spent 30 years in service to his fellow service members. 
Uh, and now he's not sure what to do when he gets up in the morning. So we now have the makings of his own healing team if we do an integrative health visit. So it included the physician. I did, someone had to manage his medical issues, right? The pharmacologist, he had lots of medications. They had to be managed. The nutritionist, but the nutritionist had to serve a little bit different role now. The nutritionist had to partner with a chef and a health coach in order to teach him actually how to live differently, not just give him advice. And as it turned out, there was a, uh, there was a program on the post called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, in which the nutritionist he'd seen in the hospital, a chef, and a health coach actually were working together. In 12 weeks, they would teach you how to cook, how to make it delicious, and how to, make it, and how to put it into your life. He said, that's for me, <laughs> okay? That's the food thing. So he did the 12-week component. He needed to get his family and friends on, right? Because he couldn't be doing the same old behaviors he had with his friends uh, if he was going to maintain this. And he needed to change his mind about why he was doing it. He had to have a good reason to do it. And if you knew Joe, he wasn't going to do it just for himself, okay? He had to have another reason. So after 12 weeks, he finishes the course. He comes back and he says, uh, why did I only find out about this and why is it only be, being offered to cardiac patients? I needed this 30 years ago. I said, Joe, great. Why don't you do it? So he said, I will. So he started the program and became the chef and opened it up to everybody, okay? Now he had found what? His purpose, absolutely. He maintained it for a year. In a year, he lost 30 pounds. He was off all except one of his hypertension medications. He was completely off his diabetes medication. He no longer had diabetes. Um, his energy was better, and his risk factors had markedly improved. The likelihood of him dying was less. He had a side effect, though. His heartburn went away. <laughs> I said, what, what heartburn? Oh, I just, I never thought it was important, so I never told you about it. He was taking it over the counter for his heartburn, uh, and now it was gone, so he thought he would tell me. <laughs> Health and well-being arise when we encourage self-care, when we integrate conventional complementary and lifestyle medicine, and when evidence shows that when we engage patients as part of the team, they become healthier and happier in these ways. This is what integrative health is about. Now, can we do this in our current healthcare system? <laughs> I heard a no. <laughs> if we don't do it, <laughs> we have to do it. It's not a question of can we. We have to actually figure it out. And the question is, it is, and the answer is, it is possible to do it. At the end of my book, I actually uh, write several stories about systems that are doing this. Not in small ways, but in huge ways. And they're not all military, but the military is already doing this, okay? Here's military folks getting uh, trained in battlefield acupuncture. It's a little five-point acupuncture technique. It doesn't use needles. It uses studs on the ears. And they're training anybody who lays hands on somebody with pain. The medics, the primary care docs, and the pain specialists and how to use this. They're also teaching people my basic mind-body techniques, breathing, stress management, et cetera. They're also doing nutrition. The last Surgeon General just happened to be a nurse, okay, the first nurse. Her signature program was called the Performance Triad, Sleep, Nutrition, Activity, embedding that as a regular routine part of military care. The VA, an even bigger, more complex system probably than the military is now doing this and doing it with a vengeance. They just launched 18 centers of excellence in integrative health. They call it whole person, whole health. And they are restructuring the entire model right along the lines that I just showed you, okay? In terms of delivering this, incorporating veterans, health coaches, complementary practitioners into the standard routine man management where the patient sets the goals, what matters to the veteran is the key aspect. So it is possible to do this. When I ask people who aren't in the VA and the, and the military, can they do it? The first thing they said is, how am I gonna pay, get it paid for? Well, you are, we're already paying for it and we're paying way too much. So the question is, how are you gonna stop paying for what you're doing? So we're already starting to do this 
out where costs have a bigger uh, impact. Now, costs have a big impact in the military and they have a big impact in the Veterans Administration. They track costs, believe it or not. But on the outside, um, we realize that not doing this is creating a huge burden on our healthcare system. 5% of patients with advanced, the ones with advanced illness, complex chronic advanced illness, are now costing 50% of the healthcare budget. 5% are costing 50% of the healthcare budget. So the focus on cost reduction has been on that top 5%. Is there a way we can reduce those costs among that top 5%? Now that makes sense, right? Or if that's where most of the money is going. But that leaves the 95% who are going in that direction pretty much unaddressed. 5% of our current health care budget goes to prevention, and only about 6 to 10% goes to primary care, where the risk factors that are leading to those advanced illnesses and those that are healthy are not really getting an integrative component. So the top is where we have an integrated system where there's care coordination, focused on preventing hospital readmissions, ED visits, reducing primary care and specialty visits, mainly specialty visits, reducing unnecessary labs and prescriptions, et cetera. That's called integrated care. Uh, we need an integrative care for the other 95%. That's at the top. We need folks that focus on, we need systems that focus on health promotion, that, life, that incorporate lifestyle and the social determinants as a key part of the management system, uh, that incorporate people like health coaches, as I described, or behaviorists, and reducing lab and imaging uh, medications and supplements, by the way, okay? We need an integrated, integrative system if we're gonna cover the entire population that walks into the office. Um, there's a name for this in health policy. It's called going from volume to value. How many have heard of that? Going to value-based healthcare? Okay, a few health policy people here. Um, we've now got one foot in the boat of value and one foot on the dock of volume and the boat is leaving the dock. <laughs> if we don't get in the boat, we're gonna fall right in the water, and many people currently are. So, can you do this now? Well, if you wait for Washington, oh, wait a minute, we're in Washington. Um, <laughs> if you wait for us to do it, it isn't gonna happen, okay? But you can do it right now. If you're a provider, how many providers in the room? Okay, if you're a provider, just start doing this in your practice. So use the example of the HOPE note and do an integrative visit. Ask about the underlying determinants, what matters to the patient. Reframe the questions to get at those underlying determinants. Add some simple methods, things that you can do in your day practice, daily, daily practice. Simple ear acupuncture, mind-body techniques, nutrition, safe supplements. You don't have to refer them down to the Integrative Medicine Center, although I'm sure they like more referrals, but you can do it actually in your own practice right now. Incorporate healing technologies. Technology is amazing. It's transforming healthcare and it can do the same thing in these areas. Heart rate variability biofeedback is a great tool that I use to teach people mind-body technique that they, when they don't want to go to a mindfulness class or can't afford it or don't, can't sit still that long. CES devices, behavioral apps are now getting incorporated in, telehealth visits that allow you to stay in touch outside the office. Redesign teams for healthcare. I've mentioned a few of those. Health coaching, team care visits, like the teams that, Je that Sally and Joe had set up, group visits, shared decision making. These are all tools that are currently available that you can use right now in your day-to-day -day practice. If you're a patient, find out what works for you and then bring that into the encounter so that you can produce an integrative practice. Find what's meaningful for you, what matters, what brings you joy, what improves your health and well-being. Come to your doctor and say, where's the evidence for this, okay? Can I integrate this with my, with my medical practice? Ask the provider to do an integrative health visit. If they don't know how to do it, go to my website. I show them exactly how to do it. <laughs> I show them how to do the hope note, how to prepare for one, how to ask the questions, and what to do afterwards. Develop your own health care team. Include the conventional, complementary, and self-care approaches, and choose something you can start on Monday in those areas. Here's the hope note. It's on my uh, website, drwaynejonas.com. 
He says how to prepare. There's a little que- there's a little booklet that you can start to do this. Whether you have a doctor come do it with you, there's instructions for a doctor to do this. If I know my patients, I can do this in a very short period of time. If I don't know them, then I have to hear all the soap notes, and then I can go into the other questions, right? Okay, in those areas, and then how to follow up with those uh, those areas. <coughs> So uh, there's a lot of other tools besides that on the website. What I'm trying to do is take the, the challenges that we have in our current healthcare system, because most of us are still on the dock, okay, uh, and say, all right, how do we do this? How do I actually get it paid for? So we've got a whole uh, instruction manual for how do you actually pay for this? There's things like annual wellness visits. Uh, if a person has a diagnosis, they can actually uh, uh, get several visits that can get covered. their CPT codes to do this. Um, the uh, group visits actually are one of the best ways to actually learn these fundamental underlying causes of how healing works, and they're actually very profitable. <laughs> you can get them covered in those areas. So there's lots of ways to do this in those areas. Well, um, don't wait for Washington. <laughs> Do this now. If we don't do it, then we're going to end up uh, in a continued advancement of not only a $2 trillion system, but a $3 and a $4 trillion system that will suck resources out of the other things that everybody loves and needs, like education, vacation, and other kinds of occasions. <laughs> the need is really to create a value-based system in those areas. And so I charge you with understanding that integrative health is not just a luxury. It actually is at the core of what's needed for chronic disease management today. We have a wonderful acute disease management system. Nobody would leave it, right? Everybody wants to use it if they need a tumor removed, if they have a broken leg, if they need a hip replaced, et cetera. Um, Joe needed it to save his life with a stent, okay? Um, but we have a terrible chronic disease prevention and management system, and we need to get on board with that with integrative health. Thank you very much. Stay on the panel, certainly. We can ask all of the panel members to join you, and then we open up to uh, questions from the audience. I think one of the things probably will need to be addressed a little bit more would be, uh, well, I mean, you can start coming up and I'll introduce you. You can come up, take your time. And uh, because I think a lot of the people here are actually uh, lay people and, and they're not practitioners. So they will probably all want some questions about how can they do it in, within the system. And that, that is going to be the challenge. Uh, so we have our, our panel members. Um, they are all very, uh, they are all dear friends of mine, and, and they'll go back a long way. So I'm really happy that they are here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Osir, who just sat down over there, is a national pack, and he, he, she's in practice with the, the CIM work since 19, 2007. 2007 oh. That's right. And uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, Dorothy Ellis, is the, is the first and second year medical student that I like, quoted. And she actually uh, came all the way from Rona. So she's a, uh, a, uh, a physical medicine and uh, rehab medicine specialist. Uh, and uh, Camilla, Camilla Vetri is a patient. It's a patient of mine since I was in practice in, in uh, gynecology eons ago. <laughs> She's also my first patient when I started the Center for Integrative Medicine. And now she's a practitioner. She works for Luann Jacobs in, in, in the serving uh, a Reiki master. And she volunteers at the Ann Street Village. So it's a great panel of all stripes. I'm here to um, answer your question. Yes, um, I am a nurse practitioner. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm not very good at it. I, I meant to ask each practitioner 
to sort of introduce himself. And, and then, <laughs> we, we, we can go finally. To, to introduce themselves. And so their perspective is just answering how healing works. So I just might. Can we start? You start. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Deirdre Orsi. I'm the Director of the Um, I thought I would just mention a couple of things as a way of introducing uh, my philosophy about health and healing. Uh, I'm a naturopathic physician, so many people here probably have never even heard of a naturopathic physician. I'm used to that. Um, and one thing I will say about the way that I uh, was trained philosophically that is particularly special for naturopathic physicians is the belief that the body has an innate healing ability. So um, conventionally, when we're looking at illness and disease and symptoms, you know, patients have uh, a symptom, they want help with it, it's interfering with their quality of life, they hurt or something's not uh, working well for them. So they come in and they ask for us as physicians or healers or healthcare providers to fix that. They make it better, doctor, please, or have you got something that can fix it? So as uh, a naturopath, philosophically, my understanding is not so much that what we need to do is go in and fix the symptom, make it go away. It's not that we need to go in and use a drug to make the symptom disappear, but rather that we need to understand why the body is creating that symptom in the first place. So the symptom is actually a message from this body that we have that is telling us something wrong. And so uh, what I try to do as a natural path is first recognize that and listen to what the body is trying to tell me. Now that sounds you know, easier than it is. It's not always easy, but it's my underlying, it's my underpinning, and most of us as naturopathic physicians are trained to do this. That's what we're looking for. Um, the body is wise, we have the vital force, this natural healing ability, and when the body isn't healing, it's because there's something stuck, there's something blocking that healing. And so, uh, trying to identify that obstacle, we call it obstacle to the cure, that's um, the formal way of putting it, we look for the obstacle to the cure. And I think that's a different paradigm, it's a paradigm shift. So for those of you here who are medical students, you know, it may help inspire you to think a little bit differently. I'm Doc Ellis, and last time I was sitting in this room, my, my name was Doc Cooper, but uh, and that's how I went back to Japan when I was a medical student at CW. And before that, I actually was a massage therapist and, and um, strongly considered going to a master class in school, um, but Instead, what I did was uh, I went through and did a master's at Georgetown in complementary and alternative medicine prior to coming here to CW. And uh, I think coming sort of from the opposite direction, doing alternative to traditional Western medicine was very interesting place to, to travel through for me because it, it sort of informed everything that I, I learned through the, the physical sciences and, and everything that we did in medical school. It just seems to to help me remember that there are there are different ways of approaching our patients, that there are different systems that sometimes we don't learn about in medical school, and that I think we are developing technologies all the time that will help to understand. Um, my specialty choice was also informed by my background in alternative medicine. Um, I didn't know about it when I was at SCW until the very end. Thank goodness I had a classmate that saved me and told me about what physical medicine and rehab was. Um, because this is a, a specialty that also works in teams. Um, we, we go off of very, a very similar model, actually, to what Dr. Jones mentioned, except that I, I have the unique opportunity to work with people on the inpatient setting, so who are in the hospital and who are too sick to go home. I help coordinate a team with, ideally, uh, a physiatrist, which is a fancy word, also, probably most people don't know this is the name of the type of medicine I do, but um, for, for physical medicine and rehab, I 
and we leave the team as a pharmacologist, like our physical therapist, occupational therapist, therapist, and ideally a um, neuropsychologist. So we're working with people whose brains don't work the way they used to, whose spinal cords don't work the way they used to, or who've been so sick for so long that maybe everything is shutting down and they're not functionally able to go home. So I feel that I have this unique privilege to be there at this sort of turning point for people to help them through that transition and ideally help them get back home, maybe at a new functional level, maybe maybe at a functional level that they're not particularly happy with. You know, they may not want to have to move to a one level living situation, works in a wheelchair, but there are ways to have quality of life and function and purpose and to, to have you know, hope in every aspect of your life. Um, and I, I think that that's one of the, the neat things that I get to do uh, as a physiatrist. And I, I'm glad that I get to, to join in on the panel and to talk kind of about how that's, that's been happening for me since I was in Dr. Tan's class. Okay. And good luck to all of you who are on the journey as well out there. Thank you. My name is Carmel Vetri. And I met Dr. Tan almost 30 years ago when he took out my leftover. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I met him. I can't remember the last Easter I've Um Since then, I've gotten involved in reintegrated medicine. I think from Dr. Tan. And 20 years I've had multiple, I've had a chronic condition for 20 years. And, uh, no, I'm going to I've had a chronic condition for 20 years. And through integrative medicine and also medical conservative uh, conventional medicine and physical therapy and all these kinds of things, I'm still walking and I'm very grateful for that. And, and integrative medicine has changed my life as a result. I can be a fan because I've integrated. I was now great to match and I've been with for two years with the lawyer. Uh, so I'm very proud of that and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you can hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am a nurse practitioner, and what we learned as nurse practitioners was, you know, we are we deal with disease prevention and health promotion, and that I think is the bottom line in your sales, nutrition, and uh, all that kind of thing, uh, exercise, physical therapy, get all that. I, this has come up before, uh, but I, I, I use the word provider to include nurses, nurse practitioners, and other types of providers that are engaged in working with patients with pain. Uh, the dilemmas that uh, nurse practitioners have, especially if they are in primary care, uh, are very similar to what primary care physicians have in terms of how do I put a team together, how do I get it covered? I've, uh, when I've incorporated the patient, how do I come to the manager? Uh, I think the philosophy uh, of nursing is much closer to be more holistic because they do pay attention to those interventions of a whole person much more than physicians do in my experience. Okay? Not always the case, but uh, they do. So I think they get it in, in that sense. Uh, the, the system changes and challenges are pretty much same, if not very similar, unless they're practicing in a special situation where you know, they, they, they can. I think it's easier for nurse practitioners to say, I am not in charge of this. You are in charge of this. Mm -hmm. And have a particular point of view that matters. So patients are more open to having that kind of a dialogue. Or, and, and perhaps some physicians 
which is a sandwich position. So, do you make a distinction between nurse practitioner and nurses? Because well, you know, I think there's a distinct uh, well, role that, that yeah, nurses yeah. need to be playing a role. But the nurse is going to be there to turn the patient over. The first thing I ever learned in nursing was that the body is sick, the mind is I'm just going to interrupt quickly. Uh, we have some microphones. I'm going to go and hand them out so we can hear the people asking questions. And people answering up here, if you can also use a microphone. Okay. You guys hear me? So I'm a general internist. I actually rotated at the CIM five years ago before I went into practice. Um, so thanks. Um, for that, it was actually incredibly helpful, even though it was only for a couple weeks. The first practice I worked at was an integrative practice that had a naturopath, acupuncturist, spa, um, and then regular primary care providers. Um, so what I'm trying to figure out now is how would you recommend, just as a panel collectively, to get you know, a main, more mainstream acceptance of this practice approach? I know like my patients have sought my care specifically if I'm in another group because of the approach that I take, which is pretty similar to what Dr. Jonas outlined, but um, it also creates a great deal of friction because of the cost issue in terms of the fact that this type of care is not something that can be done in 15 minutes. It just can't. And um, so I just would wonder if there are suggestions for that and also um, maybe also how to consider it for the, um, the hospital setting because um, you were talking about care coordination and that's something that I think is a huge issue when you don't coordinate a discharge properly, then the patient ends up back in the hospital and this could be avoided. I can speak to that a little bit, I think. Um, so my practice is, is hospital-based because I'm an inpatient rehab doc. Um, and on my team, in addition to the amazing nursing staff that keeps our patients <laughs> from getting the pressure ulcers and, and, you know, they're my eyes and ears out there. We also have um, a, a pretty amazing set of patient care coordinators and social workers that work fairly tirelessly. And I think that rehab is one of those settings that is allowed to have that. Um, and that I, I don't see that same type of um, intensity of coordination for dispo and discharge um, for the patients that are on in the, the inpatient side over in the acute hospital. And I think a lot of times that's why a lot of the, the dispo planning from, you know, uh, the hospitalist services are, you know, to rehab so that we can continue to try to figure out where to place these very difficult patients who may not have the family support and, you know, who are also at a different functional level and all of that. Um, I wish that I could tell you how to get it more accepted because what I can tell you is I think inpatient rehab is a vanishing field. I think that insurance companies are getting so strict about who they'll let come to us that eventually everybody's going to be in subacute nursing facilities um, or long-term care hospitals, um, which is really, it, it's hard to, to to take that, but uh, I, th I think that that is the way that it's going um, because I do think that that model, though incredibly helpful, I don't think there's enough wide mainstream acceptance that it works, that people understand and want to advocate for it. So I think until we're able to get out there and lobby and as physicians kind of rise up and ask for the care that we need, I, I don't know that this is going to change very much which is sort of a sad and depressing answer to your question, but. To do what it is that needs to be done because the patients want this type of care. They, they actually complain about the fact that doctors don't do this for them because they know that it will work. So I, that's a great answer. We saw a couple examples of how this could happen. 
when uh, hospitals had to start eating the costs of readmission for certain kinds of chronic illnesses, right? Congestive heart failure, COPD. Suddenly, there were mostly nurses <laughs> out there in the community taking care of these people, much better discharge planning, et cetera, et cetera, because now that was incremental. It was an inch because it was two conditions, only a few chronic conditions, and it was for like 30 days or something, right? When we know that, you know, the pyramid that I showed you <laughs> needs to be covered. They called that going to bundled care. If we bundle chronic care in general, then we could do this. Now, in the meantime, so that, I would lobby for that, okay? Because if we could do that, we would see rapid change in, uh, in a better integration of these areas. Uh, and if we got rid of the particular procedure component, you know, we, you pay for that instead of the outcomes, then people could put together wonderful models, and there's great examples in the book, I write about several of them, where they're actually doing this. And it's working, and they're saving costs, and they're improving outcomes, and they're de decreasing disparities, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be done with the right framing. In the meantime, uh, figure out workarounds, okay? Every primary care doc has to figure, well, and nurse practitioner probably, okay, uh, has, to, uh, has to figure out a way uh, uh, to get around the current way they get paid in order to provide what they know needs to be provided. So they come up with creative ways to do it. You know, most of them, but thankfully, don't do anything illegal, okay? Some do, they end up in jail, but uh, you don't have to do anything illegal. You just need to find creative ways to utilize our current system to actually cover. And on my website, I give examples of, you know, how you can code for particular visits that are perfectly legitimate that allow you to do it better now. It's not a perfect solution, but it's moving in that direction. I just want to add one thing that um, I'm not, well, I'll just say I'm not very optimistic about the whole integration into our current system because it's such a business-based system. But um, much of what we do is very low cost in the integrative therapies. So teaching someone home yoga practices, then want, they, they pay for that once and then it's free to do at home every day, going for a walk, changing your diet, uh, you know, learning lifestyle modifications and mindfulness. So that is, that's the optimistic side of it, is that these are patient-empowered, low-cost or free things for them to do, which are incredibly powerful. work in HIV AIDS care where we do have a very integrative model. We've had to because our patients, in, at least in DC, are poor often. And, and if we don't provide all the wraparound services, they don't take their medicines. And if you stop taking HIV medicines in the wrong way, you can't ever take that medicine again. So it's permanent. And so, so people have worked really hard to make that system work. Um, but it hasn't been translated broadly. And one of the things that I've seen in the infectious disease world, and I also have multiple sclerosis, so I've seen it there too, we have these horribly expensive drugs. I mean, I've never taken any of them, but what is it, like $30,000 a year for some of the MS drugs? Some of the new things you see ad ad as advertised if it has MAB on the end, it's up to like $100,000 a year. And so some of our costs are going for stuff where we're tweaking little things in the immune system and, and doing stuff that, that is, sometimes has really wonderful results and sometimes really scary results that may be, you know. So some of those costs, we get so much push from the pharmaceuticals and we get so much push from people who are making money on procedures um, and doing tests and those pieces of it, I guess I keep trying to find a way that we can short circuit so that people don't ever get there, as you say, if we can get some of the behavioral stuff. The number one indicator of poor health is poverty. Now, if we could fix that. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, everyone, for sharing your expertise and experience. I was wondering what you think are the possibilities, the potential, and also the challenges within the pediatric medical space in terms of integrative medicine for pediatrics and achieving more whole health outcomes at the patient level and by extension at the family level as a unit. So I don't see as many kids anymore, but I used to see a lot of kids. <laughs> uh, and I think it's tremendous. Um, kids respond really well. You can probably speak to this at, with Reiki, actually, uh, about, I would think, uh, is that, uh, you know, biofeedback, for example, unbelievable response with, uh, you know, chronic pain and, and things like that with kids. Uh, they respond very well to many of these uh, you know, uh, types of practices. I think it's not paid attention to as much because pediatrics in general is not paid attention to as much. Uh, if there was a large interest in that, uh, maybe your next speaker at the Sung Symposium could be Kathy Kemper from, uh, from um, uh, Ohio State University, who is you know, the do holistic Dr. Spock of the age. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad, but anyway, <laughs> she's great. Uh, and uh, she would be tremendous to actually come and talk about you know, whole healthy ch child care that uses many of these practices. And I, I mentioned her specifically because she's actually written a book on bioenergy practices uh, with kids as a, as a core part of healing, including Reiki. I know um, Lua and Jacobs does a lot of Saturn feedback. She did the Center for Integrative Medicine. I don't know if you'd like to have anything, Luann, to biofeedback. It's really easy to learn. The technology is anybody can download it on their iPhone. It's a very minimal cost to purchase the connector that takes the heart rate variability through the pulse. And almost any age can learn to do this too. And it's so quick and it's so visual and you get such great feedback that you can become very independent with it quickly. So it's a, a good investment for your money. Lillian, have we ever done anything with children in Reiki? We know, we've seen a few kids, but not a lot of kids at the center. Yeah. I know from the podiatry standpoint with children, um, I met a colleague a couple weeks ago working at Cincinnati Children's, and he talked about a model that is absolutely like what Dr. Jonas described in his talk. Um, they have resources that just are outstanding. So if you're ever looking for a place to send kiddos with functional difficulties, um, think about that because I think they've definitely got a, a system that will work. Thank you, guys. Um, it is wonderful to be in such a room full of people who are like-minded, trying to progress where our healthcare is going in our country. Um, I have been a practicing massage therapist for the last 12 years. I'm a daughter of a chiropractor. I've grown up in that functional medicine frame. Um, and what I think that I've experienced is that I am at the bottom of the healthcare totem pole. People come to me after they've seen every specialist and they are still in pain. Um, and we can, you know, we can give massage, we can tell them to take anti-inflammatories, to ice, to stretch. But how are we going to change the system to where not only is our healthcare meant to be integrative and functional, but our system is functional? I don't know, you know, I come to these healthcare conferences and I realize that we have these models that we are trying to integrate them into healthcare practices, into hospitals. You might find a naturopath that's in a cancer ward to prescribe acupuncture or homeopathic remedies, but how do we change that the system, our insurance companies, do we only do it through lobbying? Do we only find it in these symposiums when you find 300 people who are willing to actually talk to their patients about it? How are we going to provide a really dynamic change in our system to where it's going to change? Um, we can do it on a patient-to-patient -patient level. I mean, you, you were a massage therapist, and then you decided to do the master's program at GW, which I'm uh, so in awe of. But how do we go from doing it from one patient to one patient to actually changing the entire system? Um, that's what I'd like to do is in this practice and gone back to school and 
kind of started through community health and would love to do the Georgetown program, but how do we, how do we change that policy? Is it by the practitioner? Is it by the policymakers? Is it the lobbyists? I mean, where do we find that clinch pen and your experience for all, all four of you, even the Reiki practitioner, how do we, how do we get that in there? Um, I don't know how to inspire that change, so I'm hoping somebody in this room has the answer. I'd just like to add to that. Thank you so much for sharing that because I was going to share for 20 years now, I have been on the quest to find doctors who were traditionally trained, but who were taking a different approach to the whole mind, body, complementary medicine. So, and there have been people scattered out there. I've been able to find somebody here and somebody here and somebody there for the last 20 years. And that's my question, too. When does this become kind of an issue of um, systems and policy? Because I love the idea of an integrative medicine center, but that still isolates it from the rest of medicine. And how do we take a more integrative approach? Because I actually have platinum um, insurance. I have great insurance but does not cover any of these kinds of modalities. And so I end up still having to come significantly out of pocket to engage these modalities, which I know work. So I think this idea of how do we think about this from a systemic and a policy issue is so incredible because it's not new. We just haven't moved the needle forward. I'll, I'll just make one or two comments uh, about that. Um, I forget who did the original quote, but I've heard it multiple times attributed to many people. It's called follow the money. <laughs> there is so much money to be made in what we currently do in the healthcare system that if we really changed to the kind of model we're talking about this, half of what we in this room do today would go away. Okay? Somebody's going to lose. Okay? And right now, um, you know, there is a river of money to be made that's set up to get to be obtained in a certain way. And so until that fundamentally changes, the money's going to continue to flow there. And that means we have to make it more profitable, or at least more profitable than it is now, to be able to do these underlying factors of healing and make them an, a, a standard part of what's covered. I think if we got rid of modalities completely and diagnoses completely and just said, you know, pay for outcomes, okay? Pay for people to be well, okay? Or to get well, and that's what was covered, and you could make a profit off of that, okay? Then we would see some of these new models of which the you know beginnings of that I, I write about in the book and others have, like what the VA is trying to do emerge. Okay. Now, does that mean we don't need to do research to show what works and doesn't work? No, we absolutely do. But this is health services research. It's different. It's showing that hey, that wor that model works better than this model over there. Okay, because the outcomes are the same, and I can do it at lower cost, and the satisfaction and the quality is same. How many here have heard about the triple aim? Okay, so the triple aim coined by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which is the healthcare improvement organization in the country, actually probably in the world, talks about improved um, uh, quality, improved population outcomes, and reduced costs. You get all three of those at the same time. And if you do that, and we made it profitable to do that, okay, so then we would see money start to flow into models that like this can actually do that because we, we know it works. But that requires first, even deeper than that on the mind and spirit level, it requires an attitude change. It requires an openness to this. It requires an understanding that, you know, this is actually what science shows how it works. So we've got to do it. So I've been in this for 20 years, right? So I'm, I'm actually retired. I'm coming back from retirement. <laughs> So the encouraging, the encouraging thing is that things are actually changing. 20 years ago, there's hardly any conversation. I mean, you have to bang on people's doors to get any attention. 
If I hold a symposium like this, I'll get six people. Okay. So, so there is change going on, and at which, at, at what point we're going to reach that tipping point? It's hard to say, because it's always looking back to oh, that was the tipping point. But that is changing. It, it seems very slow, but it's actually the needle is actually being moved. Right. I mean, for one instance, there's a, a consortium of academic census organizations, a national organization. We started out with. The, Seven institutions. Now we have 71. Wow. So in each of the university <coughs> academic centers, there's some sort of integrated medicine entity going on, pushing that needle. Okay, so so it is it is it is changing. Very very changing. <laughs> And I, I can speak to that too. Actually, um, when I was in my massage training 18 years ago. Um, I learned things that now when I went through medical school they taught them there you know so I learned some of the things that I was learning in my anatomy and physiology and kinesiology classes in, in massage school and that was considered complementary and alternative the thing is is when complementary and alternative medicine works it stops being complementary and alternative it becomes standard of care and so that's the thing that I, I want to at least give some little element of hope I, I, I got nothing about the massage therapy coverage, though. I got to tell you, it's really frustrating because I, you know, and I've got, you know, physical therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists. I don't have a massage therapist on my team, and it's frustrating because we could really use one. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that I think, along with the rest of the modalities that are helpful um, and creating these types of care teams, it's, it's showing up. It's voting and it's it's lobbying. I mean, we have to show up in numbers that matter, and we have to have the public as a whole asking for this. And I think everybody has been, and I think that's why we're seeing the change that we are. John, can I just say yeah. something? I thought when you started it, it was to be part of a regular curriculum, and therefore that was the beginning that it was supposed to spread, not only at GW, but to other medical schools, and then become integrated into the normal curriculum so people would know about it, and then take forth with the government. That's right. So one of the models that, that actually Wade is uh, proposing is not this integrated medicine should not be a silo. It should not be just another medical specialty. The way we practice is an attitude that can be incorporated into any specialty. And that's when we, that will be the day, right? When, when everybody practices it. Sorry. As, as we're talking about um, how do we how do we add more voices to this? Um, the nurses before said that they weren't talked about much in this conversation. And although, um, Dr. Jonas, you did mention families, I really encourage you to think about patients and families. We are in a time now, my colleague and I um, both um, are part of the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care. We remember your health. Um, and uh, we're in a time now where it is accepted that patients and their families should be engaged, not just in their own care, but at the level hospitals now have groups that are called patient and family advisory uh, councils. There are patients and family members on boards of trustees. Um, so let's Let's really get the word out to patients and families because then the numbers will be big um, when you're talking about spreading the word and changing policy. And Carmela, I remember you from years ago at Youth for Understanding. I am Deborah Dawkins. Wow. 30 years ago, wow. Small world, right? I actually want to say something. Uh, first, to introduce myself, I'm Lee Frame. I'm the Program Director for Integrative Medicine here at GW. Um, just to give you guys, thank you. 
just to give you guys a, a little bit of hope is we have a master's program here at the School of Medicine in integrative medicine. And it was originally geared for providers in the Wayne Jonas sense of the word, the broadest sense of the word, to come and learn about the integrative medicine approach and then applied it to their already existing practice. And that has done really well for the last three years. I've been brought in to expand upon that because there's more demand than that. So yay for that. <laughs> Um, and it's gone way beyond providers. We have people who want to start with integrative medicine. They don't have any background. They want to go to medical school and they want to do this first. Or we have uh, health coaches, people who are into fitness or yoga instructors who are really interested in the integrative medicine approach. And so what we're doing is we're expanding our program. And we're going to have a nutrition track where they can get credentialed in nutrition. And we're going to have a health education track where they can become health educators, certified health educators, and actually go out into the world and teach people how to take power of their own health. Um, so the needle is moving. John started it, and hopefully we're moving it even farther. And I think that GW is going to be a leader in this area, uh, thanks to people like you to coming to our symposium, and thanks to the Sungs for allowing us to have this symposium. So hopefully that will give you guys a little bit more hope. I know it can be really, can be really tough to think that we're in this old-fashioned model of healthcare and it's never going to change, but Things do change, and people like us are going to be the ones who make that change happen. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to share as well. I appreciate so much um, having the opportunity to be in a community with others like-minded as well and sharing just the encouragement of actually wanting to drive these new models forward, I do feel very encouraged to hear about just the opportunity for the expansion because I think that it really is occurring. You know, I think that, you know, I, I'm reminded of that quote that, you know, Margaret Mead talks about, just never underestimate um, an ability of a thoughtful group of citizens coming together and really making the change. Um, just tomorrow, I'm actually going to be going to, it's known as the Macro Summit, which is um, essentially a conversation around value-based driven care. And so some of these pieces of, of of information with regard to care coordination and um, sort of that patient centeredness, I think is being discussed from a policy perspective. And there are conversations around it. I don't think necessarily integrative is part of the vocabulary, but I think that, you know, like things are changing. I work for um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and years ago, you know, nobody would even talk about even mind body as a, as a clinical research topic. Now, you know, I was able to even lead a meditation in my organization. So I feel that it's very encouraging to see um, this movement actually occurring. So it, it does, it's a multi-pronged approach, right? Just education, um, having these centers available and being able to share in these ways, I think is very, very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add something to that. Um, you mentioned the American Society for Clinical Oncology. So since about 2009, I think, I've been working in the GW Breast Center um, on a once a month specialty clinic that brings together a team of integrative practitioners for the post-surgical breast patients. Uh, thanks to the, you know, the head surgeon there, Dr. Christine Teal. So that's another thing that's kind of been pioneering here. That's a really wonderful program that's benefited a lot of patients. But unfortunately, it's, it's uh, not directly <clears throat> uh, under the auspice of GW. It's, it was a side uh, program that was developed through the donations of some uh, private citizens. Okay, that will be our last question. Uh, that was code that we can end it so we can all go to the sixth floor, the white coat office from on the seventh floor. I'm sorry, we see signs. And we'll have a reception uh, ready for you as we can do this. One more question. Oh, I am the last one. Oh, wow, I'm honored. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to, I am just, I can't believe I'm just so thrilled that, that you have a patient on your panel. I, I applaud you for that. Um, it's awesome. It, it, it truly, I mean, your role is, uh, it, it's empowering. Uh, I started out as a, as a mother of a child who was born prematurely. I never had an intention to get involved in medicine, yet alone integrative medicine. Started a company called Integrative Health Medicine, where I actually do get uh, personal trainers, nutritionists covered by insurance. 
So it does happen. I do do it every day. And I get to work um, with integrative practices all across the country. There are a couple models that are out there right now that CMS is doing that everybody really needs to look into. And one is the Bundled Payments of Care Improvement, BPCI Advance. CMS is covering 32 different kinds of episodes in acute care hospitals where they are looking at working with, um, you know, integrating orthopedic surgeons and uh, the, the rehabs that go along with that. Anybody that touches that patient is a part of that. And in top, on top of all of it, the cost savings are shared amongst everyone who helps control those costs. So those models are out there. Another model is chronic care, um, the CCM, chronic care management. I have a lot of health coaches that work within that, that um, environment where we also work with determinants of health and uh, working with patients who need housing in, included in their, their health care environment. So there are a lot of models that are out there. It's just that we don't, we're not, we're not no one's, I'm, I'm staring at the top of the mountain screaming my head off and <laughs> everybody's looking at me like I'm a crazy person. But there's also the diabetes prevention program that C, the CDC has covered and that CMS is now paying for lifestyle practitioners to work with you know, prevention of diabetes prevention. So there are models that are out there, it's just that they're just not promoted enough. So when you hear, you know, the crazy person, that's me standing at the top of the mountain saying, hey, you know, we, we're, I'm just so thrilled about this because it started for me in 1991 when my son was born one pound 10 ounces, hold him in the palm of your hand. He's 27 years old and although he is blind and visually impaired, he does own a video studio, so <laughs> anything's possible. On the seventh floor, 707. That's 707, seventh floor. It's the very top floor. You can't miss it. That was so fantastic. Thank you. It went really well.